slide that you do see on the screen right now is today's uh, session is called Diets to Ditch and resolutions to keep. And also, we're going to highlight a few additional webinars that we have coming up in January and in February. For January, we've got Sleep More and Stress Less. Who couldn't benefit from that? Um, and then also our personal income tax preparation and filing and federal income tax management. So please do look forward uh, and sign up and actually share it with a friend. Give the gift of education. All right, next slide. So we are presenting today's webinar through a partnership, um, but we are the University of Florida IFAS Extension, but we're, um, again, a partnership between uh, the university, the county governments, and it's a nationwide educational network. And we are delighted to bring you today's webinar along with um, future financial and nutrition webinars that um, is so kind by Hillsborough, Hillsborough County to provide us with this um, access to be able to provide GoToWebinar. And this is the webinar team. We've got Dr. Dahl, Wendy Dahl in the left-hand corner who's going to be presenting today, Wendy Lynch, myself, Julie England in Seminole County, and Jamila Lapore in Hillsborough County. So just quick housekeeping, um, if you notice the box on the, you, typically it's on the right-hand side of your screen, if that open chat box disappears, there's an orange or red arrow at the top left-hand corner, just click that and it should pop back open. Um, also, the materials section, if you aren't able to see that, let us know, um, but download those three materials as well as there's a chat box um, on the right-hand side. If you notice where the orange circle is on this screen, if you can see there's a drop-down arrow, so if you want to send a private message to one particular person, you can do that um, before you hit send. Just make sure you've got the right person. Um, but please, we encourage you to interact with us, and I, I know Dr. Dahl may have a few questions for you that she's going to be looking for a response if you'll type those in the chat box. And again, thank you to Hillsborough County for providing us webinar access today. And following the webinar today, you'll see, receive a very short and sweet evaluation. They're very, um, usually about four to five questions, but we really do appreciate your feedback. It not only helps us um, improve the webinars, but allows us to continue providing these, um, this service to our communities. And without further ado, um, Diets to Ditch and Resolutions to Keep with Dr. Dahl. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction. And I must have pulled the short straw in our webinar um, um, dis decisions because I think this diets and, and New Year's resolutions is really a, a, a hot topic, but it's also a really challenging topic. So I'm going to give it my best and see what we can, we can discuss today. So why wait? Why wait to the end of holidays to consider your news, New Year's resolution? You know, we really, it, we do a lot better if we plan ahead. We plan ahead for our holidays, so why wouldn't we plan ahead for our New Year's resolution? So today's um, objectives for the webinar, I'm hoping to dispel some current dieting myths, but really focus on describing health enhancing, uh, achievable food and eating goals for 2017. So, before I start talking about New Year's resolutions and perhaps some, some good choices to make in, in terms of food and nutrition, I thought I'd talk a little bit about really where, where does our extra body weight come from because many of us when we're thinking about New Year's resolutions, we're thinking about possibly um, a, a weight loss plan or an exercise plan, that type of thing. But many of us, of course, are struggling with some extra body weight. And so where does it come from? Um, and what might pop into your head is, you know, perhaps, you know, fast food eating, um, that sort of thing. If we look at our population, we do eat a lot of fast food, um, a lot of high calorie dense um, foods, and maybe that's part of it. Um, but if you look actually at the research, of course things like fast food and, and perhaps not the best and healthy choices do contribute to extra weight gain, but when we look at the population, as a whole, and we look at when people actually gain extra weight, 
it tends to be focused in the holidays. And so here in the U.S., we have um, a, a peak um, in the holidays. And I'm going to take a, a quick look at that in just a sec. But one of the one of the things um, just want to emphasize that say if the average weight gain was a pound a year, most of that pound is going to actually come from holiday weight gain. So here's a study that's quite interesting because it shows yearly holiday weight gain. And so I apologize that it only really focuses on Thanksgiving and Christmas and Easter. It's just that's the publication that I found. But there's also data out there for other holidays of major world religions. So it's not just specifically um, you know, Christmas in those, but also, for instance, during Ramadan. And so you can see here in the United States, we have like a peak of in percent weight change, so an increased weight at Thanksgiving, and then we have a much higher peak at Christmas. And But we're doing better than Germany. I think it's because um, of those wonderful, wonderful snacks that they have during Christmas. They have fabulous, fabulous food. Okay, but these these are definitely issues that we need to consider. So what we end up facing then, we end up facing um, that we've put on some weight over the holiday season, and now we're looking at whether or not we should come up with a New Year's resolution to perhaps eat healthier. And so if your New Year's resolution is to eat healthier, what does this mean to you? And so I'd like you to enter in some of your ideas into the chat box. Are you going to help me out, Wendy? I sure am. Okay. So one of the comments is more fruits and veggies, more vegetables, more vegetables, less sugar. I think we have a theme here. Whole grains. Oh, great. Water. That's a really good point. Yeah. Especially here in Florida. Drinks with little or no sugar. Okay. Oh, here's a good one to taste and chew your food well instead of rushing through your meals. That's a, that's a really good point. Cook at home versus eat out. Okay. And that's something I think we're going to be covering in an upcoming webinar. So that's great. So there are some of your ideas in terms of how to eat healthier and what, what it means to you. So how do, if we look, oh, we got my slide stuck here. Okay, so if our intention is to eat healthier, what is our food shopping behavior in the new year? Because part of what we eat is influenced, of course, by what we actually bring into our household. So part of what we eat is those choices that we make out of the house in terms of whether it be fast food, restaurant meals, those types of things. But also, in terms of what we eat is influenced what, by what we bring into the house. So this was a really interesting study that I want to share with you. And it's titled New Year's Res, but Illusions. So really New Year's Illusions. And it looks at food shopping in the new year and how it competes with healthy intentions. So how do the holidays and possibly the New Year's resolutions that follow influence a household's purchase pattern of healthy foods versus less healthy foods. So what this study did is it actually monitored what people purchased during the pre-holiday season, during the holiday season, and the post-holiday season, knowing that what food we bring into the house is likely, of course, the food that we're going to eat. So this first slide shows average, average weekly expenditures during both the holiday and the post-holiday season. So, and this average in the pre-holiday season looks like it's about just over $100 a week in expenditures, and of course that varies depending on family size. Um, but let's just look at the comparison instead of the exact numbers. So the pre-holiday average is about that, and you can see when we get into the Thanksgiving week, or pre-Thanksgiving, people are shopping more, buying more food, and that continues as we would expect through the holidays. But what we might not expect is in this post-holiday season, so in January, February, all the way up to March here, there is actually an increase 
in food expenditures over the pre-holiday rate, suggesting that we, we tend to spend more on food in the holidays and that there's a carryover effect that actually influences our purchasing after. And so let's take a, a look at calories in terms of purchasing calories. And so this was quite a complicated way they came up with the, with the calories per serving, but they actually just looked at all the food that the people purchased and looked at calories per serving and added it all up. And so the pre-holiday calories were just over 4,000 where the holiday, which we would expect, the holiday calories that we're purchasing, we're going to be purchasing more calories that come into our house, and it's going to be higher. But again, we have this same trend that through January, February, and all the way to March that we're actually consuming, where we're actually purchasing more calories. So this looks at the additional weekly expenditures. So what are we actually spending our extra money on? And so during the holiday season, as we would expect, we're purchasing a few more less healthy foods. Okay, so we may be purchasing pies and cookies and, and you name it. So we're, we're purchasing some less healthy foods here and we're also purchasing a few more healthy foods than usual, the pre-holiday. If we look at post-holiday, it looks to be that we actually didn't change our behavior. We're actually purchasing more less healthy foods in the post-holiday season than we, as, as many, as much as of the less healthy foods as we were in the holiday season. But what we've also done is we've increased our purchasing of healthy foods. So what seems to be happening is that individuals are purchasing, you know, a fair amount of less healthy foods, and again, there's a carryover effect where um, we're still purchasing those less healthy foods, but here we're purchasing healthier foods because likely many of us are having those New Year's resolutions that we should eat, perhaps more fruits and vegetables, etc. Okay. And one more slide on this study. This is the additional calories purchased. So in the holiday season, we're purchasing our calories as less, less healthy foods. In the post-holiday, it doesn't change. It actually gets worse. We're actually still purchasing a lot of less healthy foods, and they're even, if they can be, they're even more less healthy. Okay? And we're also, of course, purchasing some healthy foods in our calories. So, so what I want to pose to you is that could a shopping New Year's resolution actually work to improve, to improve our eating habits, but also to help us go through with these New Year's resolutions? So if, if our New Year's resolution was to eat healthy, if we actually monitored what foods we actually purchased and brought home, um, during the post-holiday season, would that help us stick to our New Year's resolution? And I'm thinking yes. And even, and even if we actually watched in terms of monitoring how much we actually spend on food, that, that actually might influence us too. Because you, as you saw with the slides, we actually purchase more food during the holidays, and that's probably not going to change. But in the post-holiday season, is it possible for us to monitor our expenditures and then maybe just stick more to those healthy foods versus the less healthy foods? So at least it's an idea. I like um, in this picture you can see, I think she's actually filled up her cart with toilet paper <laughs> before she's added all her fruits and vegetables, so she actually doesn't have a lot of room for less healthy foods. Okay, so let's now step to more personal behavior change in terms of food and eating. And we know that behavior change is definitely a challenge. And so when we're thinking about making New Year's resolutions, our goals need to be achievable. We really need to take one step at a time. And because expecting ourselves, we have such high expectations of ourselves often, expecting to, to make actually huge changes is very difficult. So it's better to look at small changes that are doable and sustainable. And then once we've achieved those, like for instance, if we made a behavior change and we've been able to stick to it, like for instance, for two to three months, there's the time to perhaps take the next step. Okay. 
So what are some ideas for one step that you could take? And so you can think, or you can use the chat box if you like, in terms of, of steps that you could take. But what I'm going to present now is some of the steps that I personally have taken, but also that I've seen that it has been successful um, if, with other individuals. And I practiced dietetics for a number of years, and these were you know, some, some of the small things that could make a big change in terms of, of food and nutrition choices. So one step that I would suggest and would be saying no to drinking sugar calories. And we know as a population that we have a pretty high intake of added sugars. And so you hear about that when you, if you read about you know, the dietary guidelines or if you participated in our past webinars, we've talked about added sugars. So sugars added to beverages and other foods. But if we really look at what we consume, the, the most of the added sugars that we consume as a population and therefore as individuals comes from drinks, comes from beverages. And so if we can actually cut back on those sugar-containing beverages, we can really take a big step towards health. So cutting one sugary drink per day could lead to a weight loss of about a pound a month, assuming that we don't replace those calories with other food. And so replacing that sugar-containing beverage with a low-calorie or no-calorie beverage is really the way to go. And that way, the calories that you, that you need can come from actually food. And food has much more satiety than beverages, really sugary beverages. And I'm not just talking about soda because, of course, many of us don't consume soda, but we do tend to, to choose beverages that are sugar-containing. For instance, like um, some of the specialty coffees out there can contain a lot of added sugar and as actually also a lot of added fat. And so take a look at what you consume and see if there's room to cut back. You really only need to cut back about eight ounces of a sugar-containing beverage to achieve that amount of weight loss. And Julie, you just mentioned that sports and energy drinks, definitely. Sports drinks, energy drinks, even um, excessive amounts of fruit juice is a problem. Another step to take to say yes to higher fiber. So here's a positive step to take because often so much about New Year's resolutions and changing our food and eating um, tends to be negative in terms of recommendations of what not to eat. So here is a positive recommendation in terms of what, what we should perhaps uh, choose to eat. So higher fiber intakes are associated with lower body weights and so lower BMI. Uh, limiting weight gain over time. So individuals with higher fiber intakes over the years tend to gain less weight. And so they end up, of course, then weighing less. And higher fiber diets are also very helpful for weight loss. There's a lot of positive research out there to show whether it's higher fiber foods or even foods with added fiber are helpful with weight loss. And there's a lot of bonus benefits. I, the list is a lot longer than what I've listed here that high fiber diets are, are associated with lower blood pressure, decreased risk of cardiovascular disease, that would be heart attacks and strokes, type 2 diabetes, some forms of cancer, but also kidney disease. There's a lot of new research showing that people who consume high fiber diets um, are much better in terms of preserving kidney function. And we know that about 1 in 10 people have problems with their kidneys. So. But also, fiber is really helpful in terms of managing uh, many chronic diseases like diabetes. Okay. So some practical tips for fiber and weight loss. Um, one of the ones that I think of is, is choosing fruit versus juice, because we're here in Florida. We, we have a lot of fresh fruit available to us. But the whole fruit has much less calories and more satisfying than the fruit juice. And any of you who have squeezed your own fruit juice um, definitely will know how many oranges or grapefruit it takes to actually make a glass of juice. And so you're getting, I mean, you're really getting, you're getting a, a, a healthy product, but you're also getting um, a lot more calories because it's much easier to drink 
for instance, three or four oranges that have been juiced than those three or four oranges because the fiber is really going to add to satisfaction. Another recommendation to increase fiber is to choose the whole grain versus refined bread in terms of bread, pasta, etc. One of the things that doesn't change with that, that choice is the calories. So whether it's a, a slice of whole grain bread or a slice of refined white bread, the calories are the same. So it's, you really just, it's about gram for gram. So the calories are the same, but what we could do when we're thinking about switching, it's a definitely a very healthy change to make in terms of eating healthier to choose whole grains. Because if we were to, if I was to present some of the evidence on whole grains, it would be similar to what we've seen with fiber. Uh, whole grains are linked to reduction of most major chronic diseases, and so a lot of really good evidence that that's a really healthy change to make. But in terms of whether it be weight loss or weight maintenance, um, also a very good goal um, is to think about how many servings of grains that we have in a day. So grains in terms of breads, pastas, etc. Um, because as a population, we consume about one extra grain a day. And that doesn't sound like much, but that's enough to contribute to a lot of extra weight. So cutting back on that one extra grain a day, um, especially if you end up cutting back on one of those grain servings, like for instance, a donut's considered is not considered a healthy green product, but it but it is considered a grain product, and um, it has of course a lot of added fat and sugar, and so cutting back on that type of grain-based food is a definitely a, a a great strategy for weight loss or maintenance. So one of the other strategies in terms of increasing fiber is learn to lo love legumes. I don't know um, if Julie is on the line, but I put this one for you, Julie, because I hear that legumes are just not your favorite. So beans, peas, and lentils. Uh, but what we can do is we can think of some novel ideas of, of, of incorporating them into our favorite foods. And so perhaps thinking and thinking out of the box in terms of how legumes can be used for dips, how we can get them into casseroles, things like that, um, even for people who, who don't love legumes. So a great way to increase fiber, because beans, peas, and lentils really are the only really natural, very high fiber food. We get quite a bit of fiber from fruits and vegetables and whole grains, but not nearly as much per serving as we get from beans, peas, and lentils. So another practical tip for increasing fiber and perhaps encouraging weight loss or weight maintenance would be to modify your plates. So this really um, just modifies it a bit from what we would consider the, well, what is the, the, the guidelines nationally in terms of if you've looked at my plate and if you've been a mem if you've participated in our past webinars where we've talked about my plate. Um, if you're looking at weight loss, then you might want to modify your plate at least at least temporarily to moving your plate to look at uh, down on it as half of non-starchy vegetables. So those would be lots of green vegetables and lower calorie vegetables to be half your plate. And then a quarter of your plate be starchy food and a quarter of your plate be protein. And of course, you'd also want to include um, fruits and dairy products in your you're eating too, but concentrate on really eating lots of those non-starchy vegetables. That's going to help with fiber and it's also going to help with satiety. Another step that's and fiber, another step that I'd like to address is saying yes to a high protein diet. And I put a question mark because this might not be appropriate for everybody. But there's is more and more evidence suggesting that we may need to move to a higher protein diet, particularly individuals that are 50 years and older. And so not that it's not appropriate for younger, but it looks to be that higher protein intakes are needed for general health of people over 50, particularly in terms of muscle strength and bone health and that type of thing. 
So higher protein diets, I've given you kind of a technical definition here of a high protein diet. It's a, it, it's a little bit of a calculation in terms of 1.2 to 1.6 grams per kilogram of protein. And so I gave it, I listed that because I just want to compare it to what we call the RDA. So that's the recommended amount of protein, which is 0.8. And so if you look that the higher protein diets are about up to about twice the recommended. And so I say recommended because that's been the recommendation for protein for many years, but as I mentioned, the recommendation at least for, for individuals over 50 perhaps needs to be higher than that. And I'm bringing it up today because higher protein diets have been shown to give improvements in appetite, body weight, and also many cardio, what we call cardiometabolic risk factors. So that's, for instance, like blood pressure and blood sugar levels and, and waist circumference and those types of measurements. So what does this mean to uh, an individual? So let's say we had an adult who weighs 154 pounds. And we, we turn that into kilograms by dividing it by 2.2. So, and if we looked at the recommendation for protein, that 154 pound adult would need about 56 grams of protein. So that's enough protein to, to be adequate. And if, we, if they increase their protein intake, for instance, because they're pursuing um, weight loss or if they're someone that falls into the over 50 category, they may then be recommended about 84 grams of protein or higher. And what the recommendations also indicate that a goal of about 25 to 30 grams of protein per meal is probably a pretty good goal in terms of, of whether it be maintaining muscle, but also in terms of helping um, minimize, um, for instance, hunger. So um, it has a good appetite suppressant effect, and, and that's what the studies show. So, so a high-protein diet may be something that you might want to consider um, for whether it be for weight loss or weight management or whether it be for muscle and bone health in, in the years after 50. So one of the things though that we have to think about is compliance long term may be challenging. And so here's where I'd like to pose this question to the audience. Why, why might you think following a high protein, higher protein diet might be challenging. Let's see if we have some responses here. Variety is one response. Yes. Yeah, definitely. My thought is you can only eat so much meat. <laughs> well, this is it. Yeah, and and that's a really good point to make, Wendy, that you can only eat so, so much meat because you definitely do want to have a variety in the diet. And I'm just going to take a look at the next slide here to show you the protein contents of different foods. And if your goal was that 25 to 30 grams of protein per meal, you can see that having three ounces of meat or poultry is going to get you there really quick. But um, if you're looking at, you know, whether it be nuts or legumes, it's much more difficult to get to that amount. And so, for instance, if an individual is a vegetarian, it's a, it's a lot harder to get to that amount of protein per meal because you have to eat actually quite, quite a bit of food. And you really have to focus on those higher protein ones. And so even though that this is a recommendation, it's hard to achieve. It's hard to achieve and keep your calories in control if you're not focused on meat. So it does. It has. A, it has that disadvantage, definitely. One of the things that we we could mention here is that in terms of satiety, legumes like the beans and chickpeas and kidney beans, etc., have a lot of satiety. There's a new study actually out that shows having a bean-based burger versus a, a meat-based burger, the bean-based has more satiety than the burger. So, so that's a good point for legumes. So 
if protein sounds like a good thing, should you go and pursue a paleo diet? And one of the things that I recommend for any of you that are interested is to take a look at this article. This article goes back to September 2014, so I don't know if you'd be able to get your hands on an, an old National Geographic, but it was a really interesting article that explored the paleo diets around the world because what you see, at least on the internet with the paleo diet, is if you, you see a lot of, of emphasis on meat and we're going to talk about the, the contents in just a, bit, a minute, but you mostly, mostly the paleo diets are talking about meat. And they're assuming that more than 10,000 years ago that humans on the planet were all consuming about the same sort of thing. But if you take a look at, at this article, it clearly shows that it depends on the food availability. And so if an individual was Inuit, in, for instance, the Arctic, their diet was very, it had meat in it, but it definitely was a very fatty diet, which was very different from individuals that might have been living in the Amazon that were eating root, roots and grubs and maybe some fish. And so there is no one paleo diet, and that's one thing to think about in terms of the arguments for diets like paleo is that you know, depending on our genetics, um, we, we may have been evolving in very different diets than what is promoted as, as the paleo diet. So the paleo diet is promoted as eating like our pale Paleolithic ancestors more than 10,000 years ago because 10,000 years ago is when agriculture was introduced. Um, as I mentioned, it's mainly meat-based and vegetables and some fruit and nuts, but it's missing grains legumes and dairy, all thought to be um, brought in with agriculture. So that's a quick look at the Paleolithic diet. So some potential benefits of the Paleolithic diet. There's definitely some evidence to suggest it's effective for weight loss, at least in the short term. So short term, there's improvements in waist circumference, um, blood pressure, triglycerides, that's the fat in the blood, compared to some of the control diets. And, and in some studies, those control diets were the diets that are recommended for, um, for instance, controlling blood pressure and, and blood lipids, for instance. So research, though, is needed on you know, is ad adverse events, so in terms of people having bad reactions uh, to eating a Paleolithic diet, for instance, in, in terms of elevating cholesterol, that sort of thing, um, long-term health effects of the Paleo diet, and adherence, which means do people actually stick to this diet. So the risks and concerns of the Paleo diet, um, one of the things is that it may exceed the recommendations for intake of protein. So it's, it's recommended that we do not consume more than 35% of our energy as protein. So, which means, like say, that would be getting, um, for instance, if you were consuming 2,000 calories a day, no more than 35% of those calories should come from protein. And that's pretty high. Our diet now, um, in the U.S. runs around 15, 16 percent protein. Uh, and so getting up to 35 percent is much, much, much higher. But um, a paleo diet can be planned that falls below that level, so, but it needs to be carefully planned. It may not meet the recommendations for carbohydrates because we do require carbohydrates. Our brain needs glucose from carbohydrates to function well, and so we, we definitely don't want to be consuming a diet that's not giving us enough glucose for good brain function. So a high protein intake may impact kidney function, and there is definite evidence um, that suggests that um, higher protein, very high protein intakes definitely um, can damage kidneys. And whether or not consuming a higher protein diet um, impacts kidney function, perhaps. So side effects of consuming the paleo diet, there's suggestion in some research that it may decrease energy levels, it may have GI effects, and surprisingly, 
Um, these reports have been diarrhea. I would expect, actually, with a paleo diet, I would expect the opposite. But there has been those reports. And there's also been reports of lots of food cravings in terms of you know, really wanting to consume some of those foods that have missed out. So, so the high meat intake could, is likely going to lead to a higher intake of saturated fats, and so, so not, not, not the most healthy choice there. But the biggest concern is that the paleo eliminates um, some food groups. You know, um, leaving out dairy, for instance, is a, is a big problem because it's going to be very difficult to meet calcium recommendations. Um, very, very difficult. And another thing that has been suggested, and this has been shown even in the research, is that it's expensive. It's really expensive to follow the paleo diet. It's, it's expensive to follow even a moderately higher protein diet, but it becomes very expensive to pursue the paleo diet because some of our, our less costly foods that we have in our diet are the grains. Um, and the legumes and those types of foods, those are the bargain foods and those are left out of this diet. So the diet is really restrictive and restriction is why it works. But the problem, of course, with the paleo diet and all diets is it works for a while. And then, of course, people end up going off of it because it is so restrictive and that's why it fails. So I wanted to use the gluten-free diet as an example of restriction, okay? Because the gluten-free diet was never meant to be a weight loss diet, but some people are using it as a weight loss diet. So it is a diet that avoids wheat, rye, barley, foods that, that contain gluten. And the diet is intended for those people who are diagnosed with celiac disease or gluten sensitivities. And that's about 1% of the population. So this diet includes fruits, vegetables, legumes, protein, dairy, etc. And it just avoids those gluten-containing grains, but it allows, for instance, corn, rice, etc. So in theory, following a gluten-free diet as a weight loss diet may promote weight loss, assuming that you cut those gluten-containing foods out and you so they're eliminated from your diet, but you don't replace them with other foods. And so and and short term that may result in a in a weight in a bit of a weight loss. But the problems with following a gluten-free diet is, first of all, there's, there's no scientific or biological basis to use a gluten-free diet as a weight loss diet. It's, it, it may work short term because it's restrictive, because it keeps you from eating those things that you used to eat. So you're not going to be having that pasta and you're not going to be having um, that, that toast for breakfast and those types of things. And so your intake may drop. Okay, um, but you're going to be missing out on, for instance, the nutrients that grain products are fortified with, for instance, iron, folate, etc. And a lot of the gluten-free foods may not contain those nutrients. So following a restriction such as the gluten-free diet, it may work short term, but it fails to address you know, the ongoing issues of whether it be high fat or added sugar intake, and it also doesn't address eating behaviors like lack of portion control. And it may lead to lower fiber intake um, and all its benefits because it excludes whole grains and so many of the gluten-free products aren't whole grain. But there's more and more products out there that are, so it's gotten a bit better there. But there's been research to show that when people switch to a gluten-free diet, they actually have negative effects on their gut health in terms of what we hear about microbiota and microbiome is negatively affected when people switch to a gluten-free diet. So another point that I'd like to, to make in terms of restriction is extreme restriction fasting. So this, is, this has become a, a bit of a trend in terms of, of practicing what's called intermittent fasting. So this is having really low energy intake um, on maybe alternate days or also like for instance um, some ways it's done is having very low energy intake on a couple of days of the week and then eating normally on the other days. And so there's been some clinical research studies that have looked at this and and whether or not people do fasting or if they just cut their usual intake, like typical dieting works, 
the effects on weight loss are about the same. So, you know, you just add up the calories for the week. And if the calories are less than the, than the actual energy expenditure, you know, people still lose weight. But there doesn't seem to be any advantages over restriction at this level. And um, one of the things that really we have to caution from pursuing something like intermittent fasting is compensation. So do we compensate by overeating after that fasting day? And, and the question is, like, the answer to that question is likely yes. And so um, what, what may happen in these situations is so you have, a, you have a day of fasting and then you have a day going back to your regular diet, but you may eat more on that regular, regular day than you would have because you didn't eat very much the day before. So that can happen. And the research also supports this. And it's happening, for instance, more and more with Ramadan. Ramadan, um, when people practice Ramadan, they fast for all daylight hours and then they eat in the evening. Traditionally, people have lost weight during that month of Ramadan. Now, a days, it's actually working the other way in terms of people actually gaining weight during Ramadan because they fast all day and then they eat um, much more than they usually would have eaten um, at night. And so even um, a tradition like this that long has actually affected body weight seems to be going the other way. So just a caution in terms of, of using fasting. There's not been much research done on it and, and it may not be successful. Plus, it's, it's an example of, of restriction. So let's take a look now and compare moderation versus restriction. So restriction, and I've given you some examples, the fasting example, the restriction of, for instance, gluten-free if it's not needed medically, um, and or cutting back calories. It's restriction tends to be an event. So we stop, we stop eating as much, we cut back, or we go on a diet. Um, there's the restriction. And the really the evidence shows that when we're restricted, we tend to react um, at some point um, like we're being punished and we need to actually go back and back to our regular eating and maybe far beyond that in terms of eating anymore to make up for what really this restriction. And that concept is really different um, compared to moderation. Moderation, I don't see it as an event or a few weeks after Christmas. Moderation is about lifestyle. And so moderation, is specifically when we talk about food and eating, are the decisions that we make every day. So in terms of the decision that we make, um, in, like for instance, I'll just use some of the things that I do. Um, moderation is why I pack my lunch and don't eat out. Um, and sometimes I eat out, but the, the vast majority of of work days all year round, I eat my packed lunch because it's moderate versus the, the higher calorie, higher fat, you name it, meals that I would be eating out. Plus, I save a lot of money. <laughs> and so that's definitely, um, you know, a good reason to continue doing that. But moderation is also, for instance, what um, might motivate us to order, um, for instance, water. Um, ice water with a, a meal out versus a calorie containing beverage. That's what moderation is about. So moderation is about lifestyle. Restriction, and I have to use the word diet, you know, is a, always seems to be perceived more so as in terms of punishment. So moderation is a choice, but restriction, we just don't like to be restricted. Okay. So I'd like to just cover a few tips for steady long-term weight loss. And I would say we don't have to use the word weight loss because none of us, or not all of us, are really wanting to pursue weight loss. Maybe we just want long-term weight maintenance. I mean, that's a really good goal. Actually, no matter what your weight is uh, today, an excellent goal is to stay at that weight just simply to prevent weight gain 
the upcoming year. I think that's a really, really good goal. So portions matter. It's all about balance and moderation. And one of the things that has been shown in research is simply using smaller plates and bowls. And I would throw also cups and glasses into that too. Because the, the glass that we use to drink our juice in the morning, if we choose to drink juice, um, they used to be very small. That They used to only hold a half a cup of juice. And now, of course, many people choose much larger cups. So smaller plates, smaller bowls, smaller cups. And another suggestion is, is waiting a little bit of time, about 10 minutes after you finish eating before and going back for seconds. Being active, exercise, staying active definitely is going to help increase your metabolism throughout the day. Lots of evidence to support that. And everybody's different. So what you decide to do to improve your health and eating, whether it be exercise also, um, you need to know what's best for you. And so what works um, for your neighbor, what works for one of your friends may not work best for you. You need to know what, what um, you want to do in terms of your eating habits and, and looking at situations and foods that are tempting for you and trying to modify them without denying yourself completely because that's where that restriction comes in. Make half your plate vegetables, so I mentioned that already. Yes, we want to remember to have some fruit and also um, you know, really every food group, but really eating a lot of those lower calorie vegetables and I mean all vegetables fit, all vegetables fit, but always including. So even taking the step to include an extra vegetable at your dinner meal. That really helps in terms of increasing vegetables, but also is going to add more fiber. Um, it's bulky, water, that type of thing, and help you um, stay satisfied. Try not to eat when you're not hungry. And this is a difficult one. And um, what can be helpful, though, is actually to keep a food log for a few days and record your level of hunger and satiety before and after each time you eat. And then you can actually make notes about your mood in terms of whether you're bored, frustrated, stress, sadness, you name it, and how that contributes to your overeating. Because to look back at that, you can probably pick up patterns. And once you've actually established patterns, you might be able to make some steps to, to change your behavior. So self-monitoring is really important. Weighing yourself regularly, and this includes throughout the holidays. So research has shown regular self-weighing at least once a week is associated with decreased body weight and, and weight maintenance. So not skipping meals. Um, distributing the calories over about four or five meals or snacks per day, definitely including breakfast, that's helpful in terms of controlling your hunger. And because having a, a, a good lunch and maybe an afternoon snack is really going to cut down on how hungry you are when you get home from work or school. So surround yourself with support. And you want to, you whether it be weight loss or weight maintenance again, talk to your family, friends, coworkers um, about ways um, they can help. And likely they're actually um, wanting the same sort of things for themselves. And so hopefully everybody's on the same page. So set goals to stay motivated because one of the things, if, if your New Year's resolution is to lose weight and you're successful in losing that weight, you'll get, a comp you'll get compliments for a few weeks and then nobody will compliment anymore. And then it'll be difficult to maintain that weight. So you'll need to set new goals in terms of, of exploring new activities, um, organizations, physical activities especially is a good thing to pursue. Focus on the quality of your diet and give yourself rewards, non-food rewards of course. So if weight loss is your New Year's resolution, is long-term weight loss possible? And yes, yes. Um, people with sustained weight loss report these types of things. So 78% of them eat breakfast every day. 75% of them weigh themselves at least once a week. 62% watch less than 10 hours of television a week. And I, I suppose we should really be considering the screen time there too. More, much more difficult to control that down to 10 hours per week. 90% exercise on average. 
about an hour a day. And so that these seem to be these key key um, strategies in terms of pursuing um, long-term weight loss or maintenance. So, and that's all I had. First day, is, is there any pressing questions out there, Wendy? None that I've seen quite yet. We, um, okay. Let me go back and scroll through to see if I missed anything, but I think we've covered. Any questions, guys, or maybe you have some barriers that um, whenever you're creating your New Year's resolution, maybe you've tried it in the past and it didn't work out, you know, what were the things that made it difficult for you? Have you come up with a plan? I don't see anyone typing. There's been a very busy chat through this. A lot of good feedback. Um, and just as a quick, oh, go ahead, Wendy. Oh, I just have a comment here from one of the one of the people in the audience about eating yogurt every day and an egg for breakfast. Is that good? Yes, it is, especially if it's a Greek yogurt and an egg, because then you're going to get upwards to 20 grams of protein in that breakfast. So that's a that's a really good choice if that's what you're after. And it is a Greek yogurt. Great. That's about 12 grams of protein right there in that Greek yogurt. Some have a bit more. Sorry, Wendy, what were you saying? Um, just as a reminder, guys, thank you for participating in today's webinar. And shortly after, they will be sending out an additional eva or an evaluation. Remember the short and sweet. Um, we really appreciate your time and feedback on those evaluations. Um, so if you uh, do receive that survey link, please fill it out for us. We'd appreciate it so much. Um, and we are ending a little early, so does anyone else have any questions or comments that they'd like to add at this time? And Jamila, too. Jamila, do you have any comments? Yes, Martha, it, we will have, it was being recorded, so once we um, send out the survey, I do believe the link um, to the recorded webinar will also be available to you then as well. What if you hate vegetables? Well, there's there's probably two things you can do if you hate vegetables. You could try to hide them in foods so you don't have to taste them. Because actually often it's the individuals that are super tasters that have problems with lots of vegetables, like vegetables that have bitter components and that sort of thing. And so there, it, there is actually biological reasons why some people hate um, a lot of vegetables. But um, if you like legumes, that's, I mean, that's a good choice. But if otherwise, if vegetables are not on your plate, then, then you need to focus a bit on fruit, for sure. I know I've tried in the past taking zucchini, where I'll peel the zucchini and puree the, the actual mm -hmm. um, veggie and, and hide it in sauces. Um, it does change the consistency just a little bit, but mm -hmm. um, you can do it with a lot of different foods. Mm -hmm. And you can bake with them too, like if you, if, say if you're making, um, say, a bran muffin or something, you can actually find recipes that incorporate the pureed vegetables. I've, I've seen sweet potatoes used a lot lately, um, mm -hmm. and and for for one of our sweet foods, which is brownies, um, you can use <laughs> sweet potatoes in those as well. So you are sneaking in a little nutrients. <laughs> Hopefully, you're keeping it low sugar, low fat. Mm -hmm. Any other comments? There's one on V8 juice. I am a super big fan of V8. I personally drink the low sodium V8. What was the question about, Wendy? It just said, can you be more specific about what you were, um, let's see, they said, what about V8 juice? Are you looking at okay. as a vegetable supplement? Yeah, it is like uh, a can of a can of V8 provides about two and a half servings of vegetables. And again, I would recommend the low sodium V8. One of the things that you want to make sure, though, if, if, if you prefer the sodium-containing one versus the low-sodium one, you want to 
try the low sodium when you haven't eaten anything salty because it doesn't taste very good after you've eaten something salty, but it tastes great if you haven't eaten anything salty. But that is, that is the New Year's resolution I did last year was to increase my fruit and vegetable intake. And what I did is I started bringing a low sodium V8 with me to work every day and I virtually, I virtually have done it all year. And so at least I know no matter what I end up having for dinner, I've had at least two and a half servings of vegetables. And I mean, it's a good product. It's just, it's just pureed vegetables. And I see a few people have used like the spiralized veggies. I tried. Mm -hmm. This was great. I actually uh, spiralized a sweet potato again and used it for noodles and mm -hmm. had like a spinach and then uh, pureed cashews. And it was delicious. My husband thought it was actually pasta. So... Um, he got an extra veggie, and it was fantastic. Excellent. Oh, I see. and then Lisa shared about putting cauliflower in a lot of foods. I know you can puree it for, um, like, mashed potatoes, um, even cauliflower pizza crust. So, guys, if there aren't any other questions um, or comments, we will go ahead and bring today's webinars uh, to a close. Thank you, Dr. Dahl. Um, let's double check. Oh, put mac and cheese and lighten the cheese. Okay. Talking about for cauliflower. Lisa adds that into her mac and cheese. Mm -hmm. Any other yeah, that's questions? A that's a great thing for kids to, to add a few vegetables to macaroni and cheese. Yeah. Really and your good. adult kids too. <laughs> <laughs> and yes, Jennifer, we um, we will have a copy of the recording. We'll send out that link um, once it's been um, uploaded. Well, thanks again, guys, for joining us. We hope you all have a safe holiday and a wonderful time with family and friends. Um, keep some of these things in mind that you, um, Dr. Dahl, presented to us today, and we look forward to seeing you at the next webinar in January.